Heavenly Father, we come for no other reason but to give you glory. We come for no other reason but to give you praise. For you are worthy to be praised. We thank you for all the blessings that you bestowed upon us. We thank you for allowing us to see a beautiful brand new day. Lord, we just say thank you for allowing us to rise with our right mind. 
Heavenly Father, we just say thank you, Lord, for keeping us through this week safely, for keeping our families safe, Lord, for keeping our community safe, Heavenly Father. We just say thank you, Lord, because you have been everything we needed you to be. If we had 10,000 tongues, we could not thank you enough for all the blessings that you bestowed upon us. But, Lord, we ask you right now to, to continue to come into our hearts, Lord. Search us, O oh Lord. And as you search us, Heavenly Father, whenever you find those things that are not of you, Heavenly Father, for those branches that are not producing fruit in our lives, those things that, those habits in our life that are keeping us from reaching our destiny, we ask you right now to, to, to trim those things out of our life, to prune those things out of our life right now so we can live a life that's as pleasing unto you, Heavenly Father. Lord, forgive us for the sins that we've committed, Heavenly Father, by thought, word, and deed. But continue to equip us, Lord, with the armor of God so we can stand the attacks of the enemy. Even though the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but we serve a God that said that there is no weapon formed against us that shall prosper. We serve a God that says that, that if we persevere through our trials and tribulations, that we will lack nothing. It will bring spiritual maturity, Heavenly Father. We just say thank you right now, Lord, for being a God that will never leave us nor forsake us. We say thank you right now, Lord, for when we are in our darkest time, that's when you shine your beautiful light in our life. We say thank you right now, Lord, for when we were sick, Heavenly Father, you healed our body. When we were in need, Lord, you provided. You protected us from things seen and unseen, Heavenly Father. But, Lord, we ask you right now to continue to move in our community, continue to move in our church, continue to move in our city, in our nation, Heavenly Father. Continue to move, Lord, and speak. For you have our attention, Heavenly Father. Lord, we just ask you right now to continue to bless us, Lord. Continue to open up our hearts and minds to receive the word that you have for us today. Allow us to be able to worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Scripture reading this morning is Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, and it reads, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. God's word for the people of God. Let's be hearers of the word and also doers of the word.
want you. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, allow the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, sit me down and you rise in my stead. We ask you to open up our hearts and minds to receive the word that you have for us today, Lord, so that we not only be hearers of the word, but also doers of the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. I ask you to turn with me tonight to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, starting at verse 9. And it reads, Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. 
and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Today we're going to focus on the topic, we are stronger together. We are stronger together. Um, type in the chat box, we are stronger together. I'm reminded of a Sokoa tree. A Sokoa tree is sometimes considered the largest living thing. They stand a massive 250 feet in the air and standing for over 1,500 years. The tree has an enormous trunk and when standing next to the tree, it makes you look so tiny. If one could ask the Sokoa tree, how have you made it this long? How were you able to withstand the storms? How were you able to withstand the winds? How have you been able to stand life situations without toppling down? Uh, the most likely answer we would think of would be its roots, that it has strong roots. But the roots only grow four feet into the ground. Uh, the real answer is what you find around the Sokoa tree. See, the Sokoa tree does not grow alone. When you see a Sokoa tree, you see a colony or a community of other Sokoa trees. They all grow together with their roots intertwining as they grow to support one another and to keep each other standing and strong. No Sokoa tree grows alone. And it's, as it is true for a Sokoa tree, it is true for a Christian that we are not going to be able to grow alone. Uh, the church is a community of believers and, and that come together to worship, teach, evangelize, and help build up the community. For the church to become a forest of sequoia trees, we must learn to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit and learn how to work together. Many of our ministries have become a morgue rather than a, a, a forest because we have chosen to work alone. But today our message will contradict that belief and it will show us that we are, need, we are needed to work together. Because we are stronger when we are together. As we look at the text, Ecclesiastes is a book that warns us not to waste our lives on worthless things. It encourages us to live a, 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 a godly life with godly values and eternal significance and spiritual priority. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 to 12, Solomon teaches in order that for us to to, to live a meaningful life, we need to learn how to value relationships over possessions. Yes, to live a meaningful life, we need to value relationships over possessions. Amen. When we learn how to value relationships over possessions, then we can feel the meaning of life. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 9 through 12 tells us this, and it gives us four ways that two is better than one. It gives us four ways that, 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 that show how we are stronger together. The first thing is this, that we're stronger together when we learn how to work together. We are stronger when we learn how to work together. See, verse 9 says that two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. The word toil or labor speaks of hard work and diligent labor. This is not the picture of a person that's sitting in a cubicle, goofing off and wasting time doing nothing. It is not a person who is working hard not to do anything during the day. But this is a picture of collaboration. This is a picture of of people coming together, benefiting from their abilities and, and supporting one another and, and encouraging and strengthening one another. Also, uh, this is a picture
nature of it shows how when we work together, we can get more accomplished. Uh, we can, we, it's some things that we are not able to do because we don't have the knowledge, but when we connect with somebody that complements us well with collaboration, that we can really move mountains. Amen. Uh, this reminds me of cultivating a meaningful life. Uh, uh, we, when we try to co cultivate a meaningful life, we got to understand that it's hard work that if we want to be successful in ministry, if we want to be successful in life, we have to put in the work. See, doing right is hard work. Building a successful career is hard work. Nurturing a godly marriage is hard work. Raising a responsible children is hard work. Doing the work of ministry is hard work. Sharing your faith with others is hard work. The assumption of the text is that a meaningful life is hard work. But the affirmation of the text that you can accomplish more when you work together with others. See, we've all heard teamwork makes the dream work, especially if you're in education. Or team, together each achieves more. These are more than just catchy phrases and sayings. If we apply these things to our lives, we can always achieve more. If we apply this to our ministry, then we can see more growth. And we cannot and will not grow alone. Uh, uh, the second thing, the second thing is that we're stronger together when we have fallen, when one has fallen. We're stronger together when one may have Fallen. Verse 9 makes the point that two are better than one with the picture of a laborer in the field. But verses 10 through 12 makes this point that of a picture of a, 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 a traveler on the road. Specifically, verse 10 addresses a common threat that every person who stands and puts one foot in front of the other may fall. Uh, 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 it doesn't matter how experienced you are at walking, you still may fall. It doesn't matter how experienced you are at walking, you still may fall. It doesn't matter how, how careful you are at walking, you still may fall. The reality of life as a follower of Christ, at times we will fall. As Donnie McCurkin, it's not that you'll fall, but it's how you get up. 1 Corinthians 10 and 12 warns us that therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. In other words, the person who thinks he or she is exempt from falling is the leading ca candidate for a fall. Remember this, you are prone to fall sometimes along life's journey. And note that verse 10 does not specify how you may fall. Uh, it doesn't say that uh, you may fall if you are not careful of how you walk or if in life that you cannot recover from your, your fall. But what it's saying that it is a guarantee that sometimes in life, when we're doing the things of Christ, we will fall. And when we do fall, we are in need of somebody there to pick us up. Uh, see, all of us will fail at times or sometime or another. You can fall so low or so hard that you cannot get up again on your own, that you are in need of somebody there to pick you up when you fail, when you make mistakes, when you make errors in life that you cannot recover from your own. You need that person that is there to give you a hand up, that is there with the ability uh, to guide you to restoration and not amputation. Let me say that again. You need somebody there in your corner that is there to help you toward restoration and not amputation. And man, you need people in your circle that allows the Holy Spirit to guide them to help you up and not kick you while you are down. See, this verse concludes, us, concludes by telling us that woe to those who fall alone, not having somebody there with the ability to lift you up. Let's understand that when we fall, 
We have somebody there named Jesus that is there to help us up. And, and the Lord will send people in our lives to help us up when we have fallen. So we are better when we have somebody there to lift us up as we have failed. The third thing is this, that we are stronger together when life have left us out in the cold and we have somebody there that can help us out. Two are better than one when we are left out in the cold. See, this is a picture of a traveler on the journey again. And as this person walks the road, the night catches up. And the path gets dark and cold. And finally, this person must find a place to sleep for the night. But they are too far from the nearest end. Uh, or they may have no room at the end. Or they may be in a desolate area that there is no place to offer hospitality to them. So this person must sleep in the elements. Sure, they have something to keep them warm, but it's not enough to keep them warm through the night. Thus, we find ourselves sometimes in a situation where we are put in elements that may put our life in jeopardy. See, verse 9 says that you need fellowship to succeed in your work. Verse 10 says you need fellowship to stand again when you have fallen but verse 11 says that you need fellowship to survive when you are left out in the cold. Being in the cold relates to disappointments, past opportunities, being taken advantage of, being pushed aside and ignored. You can be on the right road and still find yourself in a situation that is so severe that you cannot survive it on your own. Remember this. That you are not exempt from times of suffering, rejection, or disappointment. And you will need others who will warm you up when life leaves you out in the cold. Uh, uh, let me say that one more time. That you are not exempt from times of suffering, rejection, or disappointment. And you will need others who will warm you up when life leaves you in the the cold. Amen. When life leaves you in the cold, you will need friendship. When life leaves you in the cold, you will need support and encouragement. When life leaves you in the cold, you will need intercession and you need generosity of others willing to be there for you. When life leaves you out in the cold. Um, lastly, yes, lastly, we are stronger together when we learn how to fight together. We're stronger together when we learn how to fight together. Verse 12 says, and though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. This statement confronts us with the fact that you may be attacked along life's journey. You may be the victim of a personal attack. Some personal attacks come from people you don't even know. Indeed, people might not even like you just because how you look. Amen. But some people just don't like you. But even worse, some personal attacks come from people that know you very well. Uh, uh, that is, there are times when you are attacked by people who are there supposed to be working with you and alongside of you and walking with you. You will be attacked by people you thought they were on your side. But when you are attacked, understand that Ephesians 6 and 11 says that put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the attacks of the enemy or the, uh, the wiles of the devil. Our common enemy, the devil, and all his satanic forces are strategically working to undermine and overthrow your commitment to Jesus Christ. And there will be times, there will be times, there will be times when your faith is attacked and you will in, you will discover that spiritual victory often requires fellowship with others as well as faith in God I want you to remember this that there are some attacks you cannot face on your own there are some battles that you cannot fight on your own there are some enemies that you cannot defeat on your own there are some attitudes that you cannot change on your own. There are some habits that you cannot break 
on your own. There are some problems that you cannot solve on your own. There are some needs that you cannot meet on your own. But Ephesians 6 and 10 through 13 tells us this. Uh, but, but the Lord is telling us in this moment that if we come together, then we can figure out how to meet the needs. When we come together, we can figure out how to, uh, to move mountains. When we come together, we all can make it through the valley. But we are in need to work and fight together. See, Ephesians 16 and 13 tells us about spiritual warfare. Verses 14 through 17 records the battle equipment God has provided us to stand our ground against the enemy. The whole armor of God, the belt, the breastplate, shoes, the shield, the helmet, and the sword. But realize that it did not require anything for the back. <laughs> uh, the original readers understood when they read this that the ancient Roman soldier didn't need armor to protect his back because they were never alone in battle. Uh, while we're in spiritual warfare, we must not go alone in battle. We must not suffer silently. We must not be there just saying, people don't need to be in my business. We must understand that we got to have each other's back. Uh, we must learn how to come together and fight for one another. Amen. See, the Roman soldiers didn't have, it, the, the passage didn't include any back material because they knew that somebody behind them would make sure that if somebody is coming, that they're going to take care of it. Amen. That they were never in battle by themselves. And I'm encouraging you tonight to do not fight the battle by yourself. Amen. You have brothers and sisters in Christ that's there ready to fight with you in prayer, to fight with you and blessing you in the things that you're in need of. Do not fight this battle alone. Amen. We must learn how to come together and fight together. We must learn how to pray for one another. We must learn how to speak life and not death over one another. We must learn how to come and help each other during the battle. Battle. At times in this Christian army, we are fighting one another. See, this is the only army in the world that shoots and kills its own wounded, us Christian folk. Amen. Uh, 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 this is the only army in the world that shoots and kills its wounded, but it ought not to be that way. The church ought to be a place where we have one another's back and stand together when our faith is attacked. As a Christian church, we cannot promise people that they will not have any battles to fight when they put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we can promise this, that they will not be alone. So in conclusion, we are stronger together when we work together, when we pick each other up, accompany each other when life leads us out in the cold, and we will learn how to fight together. We're like sycamore trees because we were planted together, and we all are intertwining. We're all helping each other out so we can continue to stand. We are stronger together. Yes, repeat after me. We are stronger together. God's word for God's people. Glory be unto God.